Hello my dear friends, you're on the military summary channel and today we will discuss the situation in Ukraine on the 4th of April of 2023. Today we have a lot of very interesting updates, so let's start. And first we're going to start with Finland, with the country that located on the northeast of Russian Federation. As a result of a very long and difficult negotiation and discussion process, finally Finland became a part of NATO. Uh, Finland became a 31st member of this organization. Of course, this is going to cause a lot of problems for the Russians. Uh, I believe that during the previous year and this year, the Russians have already fixed and solved some kind of solutions to this situation. But for now, the Russians still are not able to give a real reply and answer to this situation because the Russians are totally and completely focused on Ukraine and on the special military operation. And these days and today, we received a lot of very interesting updates from the town by the name of Artyomovsk that used to be Bakhmut, but recently the title of this town was changed by the Russians by establishing control over the town hall of this area, over the uh, governor office that located in the central part of Bakhmut. If you take a, lo a look at this map, uh, the Russian deployment map, you see that the Russians, as a result of clashes during the previous uh, day, managed to established control more over more than 80 percent of the central part of Bakhmut and there is just a small salient that located around the railroad station and railroad that split the western part and the central part is a small salient that is under Ukrainian control. If we take a look at the Russian sources map we also see a lot of icons in this area saying that the Russians developed their progress in this area and the thing is that you may think that the entire Ukrainian defense has been collapsed in Bakhmut but it is not not true. The thing is that, as we discussed recently in the previous videos, the Ukrainians, it was their own decision. They took a decision to step back from the central Bakhmut, to save their soldiers, to save their squads, to save their army and so on. But you may ask why the Russians are so slow. And the thing is that the Russians, uh, during the previous day, published a lot of video and photo confirmation that almost every single town in the central Bakhmut that used to be under Ukrainian control is mined. There are a lot of traps, a lot of mines, a lot of explosions and so on. So that's why the Russians want to be on the safe side. Believe me, if the Russians knew that the pass in the central part of Bakhmut from the, let's say, the stadium till the railroad was uh, secure and safe, the Russians would establish control over this area even yesterday in the evening. But they want to be on the safe side. During the previous months, the Russians was, the Wagner, Wagner's was pretty damaged and uh, the head of Wagner confirmed this information recently. So that's why they don't want to have these unnecessary losses on this Ukrainian trap. So that's why they're so slow. I believe that maybe even tomorrow, by the end of tomorrow, or in the day after tomorrow, the Russians will establish control over entire central part and then we are going to start discussing the clashes and the battle for the western part of Bakhmut. But there is one important difference between like the battle, of the beginning of discussion, the clashes for the western part with the previous um, battles for central and the eastern part is that the Russians have already entered the western part from the north and the western part from the south. Furthermore, today the Russian sources map and the Russian sources reported that the Russians managed to short the distance between, so let's say, we can say that the Russians at the uh, distant, the gray zone between Bogdanovka and the Russian forces that located in the vicinity of this water reservoir. And uh, I'm not sure, I can't tell you for sure, for 100%, that this is some kind of preparation before the final storm of this Bogdanovka. Maybe this is some kind of uh, false attack trying to uh, change the Ukrainian focus and to move some forces to reinforce the Ukrainians in Bogdanovka. I don't know. But anyway, this is a very important step. And we understand that the final battle for Bakhmut is about to begin. And, uh, and to tell the truth, either the Russians and the Ukrainians don't have much time to complete this operation. For these purposes, to discuss the final battle for Bakhmut, we will talk about the uh, the, this, where the configuration of the Western Bakhmut, we're going to take a look at the topographical map and also we're going to discuss another important topic that will determine the dates and deadlines of upcoming final battle for Bakhmut. First of all, let's return back to the Western Sources map. As you can see, this map is not updated and so let's, I believe that we can update this map because 
this blue cloud either or under Russian control or is in the gray zone because most of the Ukrainian squads and forces were moved back from this area. So this is the western part of Bakhmut, the final area that uh, the Ukrainian still controls and still under Ukrainian control. Furthermore, let's update this map according to a piece of information we received from the Russian sources that as a result of uh, some kind of actions during the previous 24 hours, they started or they shortened the area, the distance between the Bogdanovka and the Russian position. So we can say, we can add this arrow showing the Russian at least possible movement, at least the thing that they have already started doing this day. So this is the current situation and furthermore we know that the Russians are pushing from the south trying to develop their bridgehead on the south in the vicinity of the statue of MiG-17 that located in the south and the Russians advances from the north and both, most of the maps shows some progress in this area, at least the Russian deployment map shows that the Russians control the north uh, the northern part of the western part of Bakhmut. So we can also update this map just for better performance and better understanding of the situation. So according to the Russian sources map, this area is also under Russian control and they do have some bridgehead in this area. So this is the picture of the current situation in western Bakhmut. Of course, we understand that there are few numbers of fortifications inside Bakhmut and the one, one of the most important one is this one block, this residential area. This block is encircled by the wide roads and I believe that this is the final area that Ukrainians um, by holding this area the Ukrainians support uh, the supply roads that connects uh, Bakhmut and Chasov Yar. So anyway, this is the focal and the vital point for the Ukrainians. And uh, as long as the Ukrainians are able to hold this square, uh, as, as long as the, Rus the Ukrainians are able to control the entire western Bakhmut. So the Russians have a lot of options for this area. And one of the most, um, of course, the easiest way, not the easiest from perspective of achievement the goal, but the easiest way to collapse the entire western Bakhmut, of course, is to establish control, as we discussed many times. Hromova, this village, this located on the northwest of Bakhmut, and of course the area with the statue of MiG-17. If the Russians are able to develop the bridgehead in, on the south, let's say something like this, and on the Hromova, let's say something like this, we can say that uh, Bakhmut has already collapsed and there are no, the Ukrainians are no longer able not even to support, to supply, but even to step back from this town because every single road that connects Bakhmut and uh, Western Bakh and Chasov Yara will be under fire, physical, of any type of controls. But there is one problem. When talking about the operation in the direction of Hromova, the Russians can't do this operation until they secure their flanks in the vicinity of Bogdanovka. Maybe Maybe this is the reason why the Russians announced about possible offensive operation in this area. Maybe they do really plan and understand if they want to collapse the Bakhmut. On the west they need to attack Bogdanovka and after that they will be able to start storming process of Hromova. Maybe this is the reason and to, at least when talking about the facts, Currently, we see exactly this picture. When talking about the south of Ukraine, about south of uh, the western part of Bakhmut, the Russians have some progress in this area, and most of the maps are showing that the Russians do have some progress. But they have progressed very far from the main main arteria. This street is some kind of Tchaikovsky street, as far as I remember. Yes, this is Tchaikovsky street, and the Russians are very far, far at least three or two streets behind this um, this main arteria. So they control the residential area, but the Ukrainians still have possibilities to the, the, you need to understand the Ukrainians are not using this Tchaikovsky street for supplying and supporting they're using the uh, square and bridgehead behind this street but anyway this is some kind of barrier and if the Russians can cross this barrier then the entire square behind the street will collapse automatically so for now the Russians have progress but they can't get very close to this area furthermore the Ukrainians publish a lot of video and photo confirmation that they were using some kind of their own flamethrower systems from behind this Tchaikovsky Koska Street in direction of Russian position and there was a lot of massive explosions and so on but we see what we see so maybe this is the current situation furthermore of course if the Russians can't take control over Hromova or they can't cross this Tchaikovsky Street the Ukrainians uh, the Russians still have an option to continue pushing from the north but this is not going to be any kind of encirclement operation this is going to be a regular push operation when the russians are trying to push the ukrainians from the western part of bakhmut 
of course this is the the hardest i believe not from even hardest maybe this is uh, from the other side is the easiest way but this is the this operation will take the longest time because you need to push you need to take town by town building by building street by street and of course it needs times and of course as i told you uh, neither the russians nor the ukrainians have this time and we will discuss this a little bit in a moment. Now, for better understanding, of course, the Russians has another option is to try to cross the railroad and to try to storm the railroad station. And mm, I don't think it's highly unlikely that the Russians are going to do this because if we take a look at the dip Western Russian deployment map, it's a railroad station. It's always very difficult. Uh, in uh, The Russians stormed the railroad station almost in every single town. And it always was a very difficult job and with a very heavy loss from the Russian side. And as you can see, there is a wide street, this is right, pretty wide railroads way, so it's not an option. But anyway, we should discuss this as a possible solution if there are no more uh, any solutions for the Russians. Of course, if the Russians are able to, let's say, take control over Khromova or somehow to penetrate the Ukrainian defense orders on the north of this western part, of course, uh, the Ukrainians will be forced to step back. And this can release some squares inside in direction in the vicinity of the railroad station, and maybe then the Russians will cross the railroad and will continue and uh, the pushing operation, but not the encirclement operation. So as you can see, there are two options: or pushing operation that will take a lot of time, or encirclement operation that may take a lot of manpower resources from the Russian side. And now it's up to the Russians to take a decision what kind of tactic they're going to use. Now let's move to another map. This is the topographical map that will allow us to understand the situation. As we discussed, this is Bakhmut, and Bakhmut, as you can see, is located in the green and blue clouds. That means that Bakhmut is located in the very, very low land on this entire square in district. And from the other side, the red squares says us about the hills. And as you can see, the Ukrainians are located in completely significant position in comparison with the Russian. It's completely in Ukrainian favor. They're located on the highest position in this area and they can control the entire Bakhmut. And you need to understand that Ukrainians in Chesov Yar can see their Bakhmut as, it, as if they can see on their own hands perfectly. Furthermore, that these uh, topographical maps from the other side explain us and the uh, Russian attempt to attack in direction of Bogdanovka. As this is Bogdanovka and as you can see Bogdanovka is located on the lowlands. So we can send that Ukrainian forces that are located in Bogdanovka are almost on the same level with the Russians who are trying currently to storm this area. The same situation about Grigorevka. So from this perspective this is pretty possible situations, pretty possible solution for the Russians. Of course, there is a very high hills behind Bogdanovka. There is a very high hills behind Ivanovska. I'm talking about the town by the name of Canal, this one. And the Ukrainians uses this area to establish their eye position and so on. So from this perspective, this is not a very easy operation. But anyway, as, as we discussed, if the Russians want to take control over Khromova, anyway, they need to take control over Bogdanovka to secure the flanks. And only after that, they can do this without taking Bogdanovka. This is suicide operation with a very heavy loss from the Russian side. Furthermore, if we take a look at this uh, topographical map, you see that uh, as we discussed, the main goal of the Russians in this battle, in this operation, is Slavensk and Kramatorsk. If the Russians are able to take these two towns, this one Slavensk Kramatorsk, then we can say that entire that the Donbas arc operation has ended because after these towns there are no more big towns where the Ukrainians are able to create uh, some kind of defense line and they will be forced to step back very far from this area in Kharkiv, in Dnipropetrovsk region, and so on. So we see that. Uh, there is just one line left before the Russians are able to do their job. It is the line from Chasov Yar to the Seversky Donetsk River. This red line and this is the hill. And this is the uh, um, will be, is going to be the toughest position from the Russians and the Ukrainians will try to hold this channel as long as possible. Let's return back one more time to the Western Sources map just for your understanding. This is um, Chasov Yar this one and the uh, the Ukrainians and the line I'm trying to show you right now this is the 
uh, the destination and direction of this highest hill in this area. And of course, the Ukrainians will try to hold because if the Ukrainians lose this hill, let's return back to topographical map, you see that from these positions, the Russians will be able to see Kramatorsk and Slavinsk as if in front of their own hands. So this is a very important line. This is a very important line for future strategical battle for Slavinsk and Kramatorsk. Now let, let's return back to the Western sources map and let's talk about timings and as we discussed two ways to possible solutions but there is one important piece of news. As we know, as we know, this April is the month of Easter. They're Easter's, we can say, because, for example, this weekend is going to be Catholic Arthur Eastern. And as we know, the Russians are not celebrating this holiday because they celebrate Orthodox Easter and the Orthodox Easter is going to start, uh, is going to be, is going to take place uh, in two weeks on the 16th of April. So in two weeks. So what does it mean? Uh, I, this is this is my now I'm going to tell you some kind of small speculations, but these speculations are completely based on the previous experience we received according to this, the results on actions in the special military operation that took place in the past. The Russians, I believe, for 99% are going to announce about the ceasefire period during the Eastern period, I believe from Friday till Sunday. So there are going to be three days of ceasefire period. So that means that, of course, the Ukrainians will be able to use this ceasefire period to do something, rotation, reloading, uh, fulfilling, uh, replacements, and so on. So that means that by the end of the next week, the Russians need to establish such kind of bridgehead in Anartyomovsk that will not allow the Ukrainians to complete rotation process inside of this town successfully before Eastern. And but this is not the of course it will be like the, but the best solution for the Russians to establish control over entire Bakhmut and I believe that there is some kind of orders from Putin and the headquarters of Russian Federation to complete the mission and liberation of uh, or taking control of Bakh Artyomovs before the Eastern but we all and we everybody understand that highly unlikely that the Russians are able to do this because it's there are still a lot of job in this western part especially about this uh, about this block. And this is not, and this is not the last thing. Furthermore, okay, let's say the uh, the parties pass by the Eastern holidays and so on, and then we understand that on the 9th of May is going to be a victory day. We discussed the situation the same in the same at the same days the year ago, and that was about situation about Mariupol that the Russians were planning and were trying to establish the 100% control over Mariupol by the 9th of May and many many other things that the Russians wanted to connect these two events like liberation of Mariupol and uh, the 9th of May and this year the Russians are going to do the same they need to complete the um, uh, liberation of Artyomovsk before the 9th of May and if they need to do this that means of course they need a week of some kind of distance between the real liberation and the holidays some something like a week because they need to make some some things in the town they need to demand to do some clearing operation Maybe they are going to make some event or video even inside of Artyomovs if they are able to do this. And the Ukrainians understand this situation the same. I believe that Ukrainians at least they have the goal to hold Bakhmut, Artyomovsk at least till the 9th of May. So to ruin the Russians' plans for the victory day. Now this is their main goal. And as we understand, one month behind this event, even less, because the Russians need to do this at least by the 1st of May. As you can see, there are going to be one ceasefire period, at least I believe so, somewhere in the middle of this year. And after the ceasefire period, after the uh, eastern ceasefire, the Russians will start the final push. And it is going to be something indescribable un un and unbelievable, believe me. Right exactly after Eastern ceasefire, the Russians will throw and drop their everything they have but to take control over Tomovsk before the 1st of uh, May. Another important piece of news is coming from the uh, Minister of Defense of Russian Federation and I was very surprised and wondered by that numbers. The Russians are saying that as a result of clashes on Donetsk front line, the Ukrainians lost just 73 uh, soldiers and 
uh, eight armored vehicles and two artillery systems. So as you can see, the level of losses of the Ukrainians on the Donetsk front line is the lowest since the beginning of the special military operation. Just 73 soldiers. It's the lowest level. But from the other side, the, Rus side, the Russians are saying that during the clashes on the Liman front line, the Ukrainians lost 225 soldiers, three armored vehicles and two artillery systems. We can say that when talking about Liman, this is the highest level of losses since the beginning of the special military operation. Uh, some, uh, some members of military summary team, uh, we discussed the situation and maybe we, some, some, you know, some members were saying that maybe the Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation made a mistake because it's impossible to uh, to see uh, the numbers, but on completely different front lines. But I analyzed this data, data, and I believe that this um, uh, this uh, information, piece of information about the losses, is completely correlated with the situation on the ground, and it, this confirms the situation in Bakhmut for hundred percent. As I told you, there are no clashes in the central part of Bakhmut. There are just sniper positions from the Ukrainian side. There are a lot of snipers from the Ukrainian side who try to keep a distance between them and Russian soldiers. There are a lot of engineering forces who currently try to, ex to mine this area and to make explosions using the distance method of detonation or something like this. And the, the Russians are just doing clearing operation. So they're just trying to enter a building, to demine the building, and then they're going, going next, trying to keep a distance with the Ukrainian sniper positions. So this is the reason that, that the level of the losses is so low but from the other side we see that the russians have activated on the liman front line and this is very interesting because yesterday the russians were saying about the loss in the level of 50 soldiers from the ukrainian side so very interesting this is very heavy and a big level of losses but from the other side the russian source are saying that recently the Russians, and there is even an icon of this area, as you can see, this Udartos 1A. So that means that the Russians are, uses um, their flamethrower systems in this area. But the thing is that the Russians reported that during the previous months they managed to upgrade their systems. If you know this flamethrower system is the most powerful weapon on the ground uh, from the Russian side when talking just the units and so on, and the Ukrainians are afraid of this uh, type of weapon the most of all. And uh, recently there used to, the Russians used to use use uh, missiles that uh, the distance and the range of their usage was not not more than six kilometers and if you remember there was there were very heavy clashes in Uglidar and the Russians to attack Uglidar with the flamethrower systems were forced to get those systems very close to the combat lines and if I remember we got reports from the uh, Russian and Ukrainian side that as a result of war battle for Uglidar, the Russians lost up to five flamethrower systems because they were forced to get them very close to the combat line. They were spotted and discovered by the Ukrainians and destroyed by the Ukrainian artillery system. And now the Russians have upgraded their missile and they increased the range of this missile from 6 to 12 kilometers. And the Russians start production of these flamethrower system massively and now they're sending these flamethrower systems all over the front line with the modern upgrade graded missiles of course it can be a possible game changer and i believe that this is the reason of the such a losses of ukrainians on the liman front line they didn't expect that the russians will deploy their upgraded flamethrower systems and we see that the russians attacking forest uh, all the possible ukrainian defense positions and mainly main places where the ukrainians have their positions is inside towns and forests and it's nothing for flamethrower systems they can destroy anything and uh, inside of any type of these defense lines so very interesting when talking about coupons there are no changes the Ukrainian lost just 30 soldiers to four, two armored vehicles and one artillery system the russians are saying that using artillery attack and drone intelligence they're trying to um, destroy and trying to um, reduce the ukrainian rotation possibilities and they're saying the russians that they're pretty successful in that when talking about Avdiivka, there are no changes, just heavy artillery duels. The Russians are saying that as a result of clashes, they managed to destroy a few D-30 artillery systems, just they're attacking some positions, but without any changes. This front line has been stabilized, and I believe that now the Russians expect the Ukrainian counter-offensive operation in this area. When talking about South Donetsk and Zaporozhye areas, you can see there are a lot of icons, but and the thing is that the Russians reported that as a result of clashes on the South Donetsk and Zaporozhye area, the Ukrainians 
lost 115 soldiers. And this is also a very heavy, high level of losses in comparison with the previous days. So I see that the Russians have activated in this area as well, at least for the previous 24 hours. We will we need more data, we need more information to analyze whether the Russians are going to increase the to continue this level or it's just some case and they were pretty well, maybe they got some luck and managed to destroy another convoy convoy or something like this. But from the other side, we know that the, the Ukrainians to start their counter-offensive operation need to co collect forces here. And every, every time when they collect forces, it's the perfect target for uh, the Russians. Uh, furthermore, in the final area, Kherson, uh, there are not much changes just as a result of artillery duels. The Ukrainians lost few artillery systems, few uh, armored vehicles and 10 soldiers and 10 uh, units of manpower. Uh, but this is not the final piece of news. Uh, the, Rus the Western sources are saying that, the Ukrainian sources are saying that the Russians recently uh, start, have started using guided bombs and now they are saying that the Russians are uses around 20 guided bombs per day. So, and they're increasing and increasing the level of such, uh, the number of such bombs, usage of such bomb every day. And of course, these guided bombs can also become some kind of game changer in the upcoming summer and spring military phase of this special operation. And of course, the updates for the Ukrainians from the Western countries, the NATO countries and the Western countries announced about another military aid for 2.6 billions of dollars. Yes, another big um, aid and of course there are a lot of missiles in that pocket a lot of rockets missiles and many many other modern and powerful western weapon that ukrainians uses against the russians and the russian uh, forces uh, and one more time one more thing about uh, bakhmut and so on uh, today there is a very important update and this that's it um, uh, the deployment map has been updated and the ukrainian sources are showing that uh, there deployed 12th separate tank brigade right behind of chest of yar and there are just two options or the ukrainians want to prevent any penetration and collapsing on the front line so they brought their armored fist or maybe the ukrainians are planning to start counter offensive operation in the south using this newly created 12th separate tank brigade we'll see i believe that as we told the dead the deadline is the 9th of may and the first pause and the some kind of uh, ceasefire period we're going to see on the uh, orthodox eastern so not much time left and this is going to be very hot time period of time and that's it for today military summer channel reminds you condemn any violence in ukraine thank you for your watching subscribe to my channel put your like join my patreon have a good day bye bye